Okay, so welcome to the video for chapter six, uh, where we're going to talk about the kinds of ecosystems and uh, communities that exist on the globe. Now, looking at a quick outline for this chapter, we're first going to talk about succession. So we're going to define it, talk about what it is, then we'll look at primary succession and secondary succession. Then we'll um, talk about how biomes are determined. So basically what determines uh, where a biome is located and what kind of biome is going to be uh, in that area. Then we'll go over the major biomes of the world. So this that will be kind of a quick and dirty overview. It's mainly, you know, memorization and um, basically just, you know, memorizing some characteristics about those biomes. So I won't spend too much time on it. It is a kind of a lot of information and so you just need to make sure you go over it and, and kind of look at the characteristics of, of each biome. Um, and then we'll finish up looking at aquatic biomes. So 6.3 is going to be terrestrial biomes and then 6.4 uh, is going to be the aquatic biomes. Okay, so first off succession. Um, what exactly is succession? Well, it's these predictable changes that occur in community structure over time. And whenever I say community structure, we're referring to like species composition. Um, so what species are present in the community um, and kind of how that changes over time. Um, and so succession is a process of, of those changes and they're somewhat predictable in terms of the types of species that are going to um, be found during that successional process. Um, and the organisms and, or species that are kind of found in the environment during the different stages of that, of the, that successional process actually affects and changes the surroundings of their environment and they can make the environment uh, more suitable or less suitable for other kinds of organisms uh, and we'll talk a, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, whenever we talk exactly about like primary and secondary succession and uh, like one other thing I want to just kind of mention while we're on the, the the topic of like defining what succession is um, we should kind of talk about what a climax community is. And so climax, right? Climax means like at the top, right? So the end basically, so it's the end community. Um, so the basically the top community in that successional process. Um, and the climax community is the stable long lasting community that you end up with after the process of succession. Um, and the type of climax community that you have is really determined by the climatic factors that are in the area, but the biotic factors also can determine that as well. Um, and again, we'll talk more about that as we kind of go through primary and secondary succession. And so looking at, spe at succession specifically, uh, I mentioned there are two different types of successional processes. You have primary succession, and you have secondary succession. So primary succession is whenever you have no organisms on the landscape, it's a bare surface, there's only minerals or water or kind of rocky surfaces that um, a community will develop from. Secondary succession exists kind of after a disturbance has happened in an existing ecosystem. So let's say you have an ecosystem and a wildfire comes through and it kind of erases the community that was on the landscape. The secondary succession is the process of succession that happens after that um, disturbance. Uh, secondary succession is much more common than uh, primary succession and happens a lot faster than primary succession, mainly because it has this kind of set starting point that uh, primary succession really doesn't have. And so secondary succession almost has like a head start in the process versus, versus primary succession. And looking at terrestrial primary succession, um, so let's say you are 
on an island, right, that had just formed uh, from some volcanic activity, some magma um, erupting through, you know, the bottom of the ocean and building up a, a, an island of volcanic rock over time. Um, that island has no organisms really present on it. Um, it's mainly, you know, volcanic rock and some other minerals or, or other um, um, types of uh, non-organic substrate, right? So, so non-living substrates. Um, the uh, initial community that starts out is going to be a, a pioneer community. And because there was no ecosystem there to begin with, um, it is primary succession. And the initial species or organisms that first kind of take over that island and start colonizing that area um, are, is called the pioneer community. They're basically pioneering the ecosystem um, for the communities that are going to come after. And a lot of these species have to be able to colonize bare rock. And so, for example, lichens are a really common pioneer species, lichen, mosses, those types of, of plant, or not plant, but those types of organisms. And so um, this image is showing, showing some lichen species that's on a rock. And the lichens are going to help break down that rock, erode it, and cause debris to accumulate on the surface. And then that will start the formation of a thin soil layer. And then that soil layer can then start supporting smaller life forms like bacteria, microbes, um, other small invertebrates, that sort of thing, or even small vertebrates, uh, small, you know, smaller plant species, uh, more like your annual uh, plants, uh, so like some smaller herbs or forbs or flowers. Um, and then over time, that soil layer will build up and, and you'll get this kind of development of the soil profile over time. And so each step in this process is known as a successional stage. And um, the individual stages are known as a series. Okay, so it's a serial stage. All right, so in primary succession, you're starting out with, you know, this non-pre-existing community. So you need those pioneer species, the lichens and the annuals. And then eventually the annuals, so those flowers and forbs, will be replaced by a more perennial-based community. So trees, uh, larger shrubs, et cetera. And then um, after you get those shrubs and trees to develop, uh, you get your um, climax community. And, and then remember that climax community is kind of that stable, long lasting community. And so here in these three series, we've got kind of perennial shrubs to shade intolerant trees and then to shade tolerant trees. And basically it goes through this, um, this succession of stages is because your shrubs will start growing, right? And then when your trees come in, the trees that grow require a lot of sunlight. And since there's no trees on the landscape before them, they don't have to compete for sunlight. They have access to pretty much all of it. But then once you get the development of those shade intolerant trees, now there's shade on the lower story. And so since those trees can't grow in shade, now the shade intolerant trees will be replaced with trees that can tolerate shade because they need the seeds to be able to germinate when there are trees present, when there are shade uh, present. And then you eventually you'll end up with the stable climax community that's made up of um, a specific you know, set of species and populations again, depending on the climate and the location on, on the globe. And like we mentioned, the climax community will have typical characteristics um, that you can compare with certain successional communities. Um, climax communities will have um, a main, uh, so they, they're able to keep the level of species diversity in that community for an extended period of time. So if it's a climax community that has like a really high species diversity, diversity, it, it would persist over longer periods of time. There would be specialized ecological niches. So remember types of, of habitats and 
um, biological and, and abiotic factors that determine species presence. They will have lots of organisms, organism interactions. And then the climax communities will recycle nutrients. Uh, so they'll have those nutrient cycles existing in that landscape and ecosystem. And so as succession kind of moves forward, you tend to get this increasing in complexity and the ecosystem tends to be more efficient in its functioning and, and use of, of energy and um, matter in the system. Now, looking at aquatic primary succession, um, you know, other than an ocean, most aquatic systems are really considered as, as temporary systems because over longer periods of time, say hundreds to, to thousands of years, that aquatic system will get inputs of soil, um, you know, from erosion, that sort of thing. Plants and organic matter will grow and die and fill in those aquatic systems. And you'll get a gradual filling of these bodies of water. And um, so you'll get roots and stems to accumulate below the, the water li uh, line. And so you'll get an establishment of wet soil. And so eventually those aquatic systems will fill in. And so you have this primary succession of aquatic systems going from, you know, like a lake or a pond to eventual filling in to kind of this wetland, boggy environment, uh, again, depending on climate, and then it could potentially fill in for good. Um, looking at primary succession on land, this is kind of the um, stages uh, or, or serial stages that you would expect. Um, remember, we're pioneer succession. We're starting with bare rock. Uh, again, because this only bare rock, you need species that can live and exist on bare rock. So you have your lichens. And then once soil starts to form, notice you have this small layer of soil forming. Now you can get like your annual plant, your grasses, your herbs, your forbs, your flowers. Then those will eventually start to shift into perennial species. So like your shrubs. Um, and then you'll get your shade intolerant trees. So notice there's no, not a lot of shade here. So those shade, those trees that don't like shade will tend to grow. And then uh, once shady areas become established, then only the shade intolerant trees can grow. And so you'll get a shift from shade intolerant trees to shade tolerant trees. You can see conifer species to, to oak species in this example, or not oak, but hardwood. What you also notice is over, over time, the depth of the soil layer gets thicker and thicker and deeper and deeper and more well-developed. Um, and that's because you have, you know, microbes and invertebrates and, um, you know, um, vertebrates that burrow underground and, um, you know, this whole soil community that's causing the development of the soil and organic matter coming from the plants and the trees and the grasses, you know, adding to the organic layer. And so your soil develops over time um, until you eventually get your, your climax community that we mentioned before. Now with secondary succession, it's a little different from primary succession. One, because it's not like a new area that hasn't had organisms before. It's the successional process of an ecosystem that is disturbed or destroyed there's a lot of the soil remaining, some of the organisms may remain, and they don't start out from that bare rock um, initial stage. So there's a soil layer there, there's some organisms there to kind of grow back from. And so because you have these soils and nutrients remaining, the process advances a lot more rapidly than primary succession because with primary succession, that soil has to form right over time. And that can take hundreds to thousands of years, depending on what that parent material is. So what that rock material is that the soil is forming from, depending on whether or not it's in a cold or dry environment or a cold or hot or wet or dry. So there's a lot of factors that can come into play for that. Same thing with, with uh, secondary succession, but generally it's going to be much more faster than primary succession. And then the plants and organisms that survive the disturbance, they're going to grow and, and um, replace themselves pretty quickly, uh, reestablish. Uh, undamaged communities nearby will start 
serving as a source for animals and seeds. So for example, if this is the ecosystem that was disturbed, you'll have surrounding communities, right? And then those organisms can come in and take advantage of that empty space and start that recolonization and, and continue moving that ecosystem during, uh, into the next uh, succession stages. And then your new climax community is most likely going to resemble the destroyed community. There could be some differences depending on what species get there first and whether or not competition exists in some species, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, they're most likely going to be pretty similar to the ecosystem that existed before. Um, and so, for example, if you have an oak hickory forest that was destroyed to, say, farmland, uh, that farmland becomes abandoned. After a couple of years, you'll get grasses and uh, some, some herbs to grow, and then you'll get your shrubs to grow, and then, you know, pines start to replace the shrubs. Uh, so, like, maybe your shade-intolerant species and then your shade-tolerant species start to grow in. The pines die. You get your mature oaks and your hickory trees, your hardwood trees to start replacing. And then you end up with that mature hardwood forest. But again, this depends on the climate. If there's not enough water to support those deciduous trees, those hardwood trees, then you're going to end up with a conifer forest, uh, which would have been the same type of forest probably when you started. But again, climate is going to determine that as we'll talk about whenever we go over the different biomes uh, uh, that exist across the globe. And so, so, you know, there are some modern concepts of succession and climax communities that we can look at. So settlers came in, they changed these original ecosystems to farmland and agriculture, air, agricultural areas. We see those climax communities being destroyed. A lot of those farms were abandoned and then the land undergoes succession and returns to those original communities. And now that's not always the case. Again, it depends on the ecosystem and the type of community that was there. Um, so for example, rainforests are really complex ecosystems, lots of biodiversity. And so it's not necessarily the case that if you say slash and burn a rainforest for ag, that you'll get um, a, a climax community that's exactly the same uh, as a rainforest that was there initially. Uh, but a lot of the times that, that can be the case. Um, and so what this has done is it's led ecologists to you know, look at that there's not a fixed or predetermined community for each part of the world. Really the only thing differentiating these climax communities from any other successional community is the time scale and, and the, uh, the development, right? that um, happens over that time and basically what stage of succession you're looking at. And in terms of the um, areas or biomes that exist uh, across the globe, we're now gonna kind of take a quick tour of that. This is really kind of a lot of the rest of the chapter. And like I said, there's uh, a lot of information in this. Uh, there's a lot of slides for these, but we're going to kind of go through them fairly quickly because, again, a lot of it is like, you know, just memorization for characteristics of, of specific biomes that you guys can kind of look at on your own. But what I want to first do is just talk about how biomes are really determined um, kind of by temperature and precipitation. Uh, and we can actually map what biomes are going to be present based off of average temperatures and precipitation. Um, and biomes are just terrestrial climax communities that have really wide geographic distributions, kind of characteristic vegetations um, and temperatures and, and precipitation patterns that um, you would expect to see like in a given region or location. And so that's really kind of what a biome is. Um, and so for example, if we look at the biomes of the world, you have, you know, deserts, right? So we have Sahara, you have your southwestern deserts, Sonora, the Mojave, right? you have your um, deserts in the Middle East, you also have your tropical rainforests, you have your tropical dry forests, which are like your savanna ecosystems, you have your taiga, which is your boreal conifer forest, you have your tundra, you know, like up here, and so a lot of the biomes you see on the different continents, and again, What's also interesting is they're very characteristic of latitude. 
um, because latitude kind of determines climatic conditions. So if you notice, a lot of the deserts are along these lines, right? These are 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And what happens here is really interesting is that at the equator, you got warm, moist air rising. That causes a lot of rain at the equator. And then that air will move poleward. And then as it moves poleward, it becomes very dry because all of that precipitation has dropped out. It also cools. And when it cools, it gets denser. So it falls to the surface of the earth. And when it falls to the surface of the earth, it's cool and dry. And so there's no rain. And so you get deserts in, in those locations of, of 30 degrees north and south. And so that kind of goes with the idea of precipitation and temperature really determining um, what kinds of biomes and climax communities that you'll get in a given part of the world. And so, for example, if the average temperature is warm and very wet, you're going to get a tropical rainforest. If it's warm and very dry, you're going to get a hot desert. But if it's dry and very cold, if it's super cold, you'll get a tundra. If it's, um, you know, not below freezing all the time, um, it kind of fluctuates a little bit, you'll get a cold desert. Uh, for example, some of the uh, Great Basin areas on the east side of the Sierras are classified as, as a cold desert. Um, and then you can get you know, a little wetter, then you start getting in the northern conifer forest, like in um, northwestern or the northern part of the, the state of California. Temperate grasslands, temperate deciduous forests, again, determined, on, determined by precipitation. So this area is basically whether or not you're dry or wet. Um, same thing with savanna and your dry forest and your tropical rainforest. Um, so again, average temperature and average precipitation are very good predictors for the type of biome that you would get uh, at a specific location on the globe. And now, you know, that, that then suggests that the distribution of these ecosystems are related to those two factors. Uh, and because temperature is warmest near the equator and cooler near the poles, you expect biomes to be related to latitude, right? And then also with elevation, as altitude increases, your temperature decreases. And so what's really cool about California is even though we're not at the latitude where you expect to find, you know, tundra or alpine ecosystems, you can go in the upper elevations of the Sierras and find those ecosystems, those biomes. You can find um, tundra biomes, uh, alpine ecosystems, alpine biomes in the, the upper elevations of the Sierras because of the higher altitude causes that temperature to decrease. And so if you move from sea level to mountaintops, you pass through biomes, just like you pass through biomes going from the equator to the latitudes, right? And so for example, you go from the equator up to the North Pole and you pass through these ecosystems, right? Uh, tropical rainforest, deciduous forest, boreal forest, tundra, etc. But what's also cool is if you go up in elevation, right? so um, I think this is meters, like 4,500 meters, 5,500 meters, you're in the same, you know, biomes that you would be at, at 65 degrees latitude or, you know, 80 degrees latitude, um, which is, which is pretty interesting. And so with that, we're just going to now just kind of take a tour of the biomes that exist in the world. Um, and, and so we'll start with kind of the warm, dry, uh, so deserts, uh, low precipitation, um, and the precipitation that they get is, is pretty unevenly distributed. Uh, they can be windy because, again, they have that warm air kind of moving down, uh, and that tends to cause wind. They get really large temperature fluctuations because there's no clouds in the sky. And so they have a lot of radiation during the day and then that heats up the land. But then all of that heat kind of dissipates into the atmosphere because there's no blanket of clouds covering it and to keep that heat in. So it can be really hot during the day and then like, you know, 50, 40 degrees at night, uh, sometimes even lower. Um, and because the deserts are so harsh in terms of conditions, um, you see a lot of evolutionary adaptations for specialization and species that 
uh, and organisms that live in, in desert ecosystems. Um, the big factor for deserts is just the lack of water. Um, deserts, again, you know, less than 10 inches of precipitation per year. Um, and so what's interesting is that in deserts, even though there are many different species that live in deserts in terms of, of organ, you know, living organisms, they typically have low population numbers. Um, so lots of species, low, low population numbers. Um, human impacts on deserts, um, generally we have little impacts, but the kind of irrigation systems and the ability of, of transport waters allowed us to kind of colonize deserts. Um, and so we get some development in deserts, but uh, really if you would like look at a map of uh, areas with deserts, not a lot of not a lot of development compared to to other locations. Next biome <clears throat> is the temperate grasslands. Uh, this is also known as the prairies or the steppes. Uh, so they receive uh, a little bit more precipitation, so 25 to 75 centimeters. Um, they rely heavily on fire uh, to prevent kind of the um, trees and perennials from um, grabbing hold in, in these ecosystems. And um, the fire also releases a lot of nutrients back into the soil. So a real nutrient pulse uh, as it burns that organic matter uh, and releases nutrients back into the soil profile. Um, you get a lot of kind of grazers and herbivores um, that live in these areas. Uh, and a lot of insect species as well, because the grasses are so prevalent. Um, a lot of the grasslands have been converted to ag because of the amount of biomass, the amount of grass that, that grows every year leads to a really thick organic layer in grassland ecosystems, which are really good for growing crops. And um, if those grasslands tend to be a little drier, instead of growing crops, they're usually used for, for grazing. So like cattle ranches and sheep ranches, etc. Um, there's very little grasslands that's undisturbed, lots of fragments um, that remain. But again, preserving these fragments is, is one of the kind of big priorities um, that we should look at in terms of, of protecting this type of biome. Um, and this is just a picture of uh, some species that you can see in, in uh, prairie grassland landscapes and what the uh, typical precipitation and temperature curves look like for, for temperate grasslands. Next is the savanna. So they get more precipitation than, than grasslands. And because of that, you get uh, patches of trees. And so you can think of this as like uh, basically the foothills of California. So with grasslands and oak trees, kind of this oak savanna, it's basically what it's called. Um, and so savannas will have the grasslands with, with those patches of trees. And fire, again, is a really common feature in savannas, again, because of that grass structure. Um, and a lot of the trees here uh, are used in nitrogen fixation. Uh, so remember nitrogen fixation from the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so basically the roots that can kind of fix nitrogen with that symbiotic bacteria to, to put it, the atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form, uh, basically, for plants. In terms of human impacts, uh, savannas, just like grasslands, really heavily impacted by agriculture. Um, <clears throat> but uh, irrigation is needed uh, with this because there can be long periods of droughts um, that exist in, in savanna type ecosystems. A lot of the savanna ecosystems could be um, uh, support nomadic herding. So basically you have herders that will travel around to where the rains are and where the grasses exist to allow their livestock to kind of graze on those areas. And um, in Africa, there are a lot of savanna ecosystems that are protected. Um, so for example, you can go on the, you know, savanna tours, um, that sort of thing where you ride in the Jeeps, looking at the lions and the grazers and the predators that eat the grazers and that sort of thing. And so savannas a really unique ecosystem. And now kind of moving on away from that, um, where you're getting around the same average amount of precipitation, slightly a little less than savannas, but in kind of a different area of the world, um, you get Mediterranean shrublands. And so this is more of a coastal 
um, region instead of like an interior region, which is where you would find like your savanna areas. And this is uh, pretty much dominated by shrubby plants, uh, typically termed chaparral uh, vegetation. And they're really dominated by fire. Uh, fire is a really big factor in keeping these ecosystems healthy, again, because of nutrient pulses um, into the, the soil, but also in keeping other um, trees or larger vegetation species from kind of overtaking the, the shrub and the chaparral species. Um, and these chaparral plants are really adapted for hot, dry summers uh, because a lot of the precipitation uh, is, is uh, it exists in the, uh, the winters. Uh, so like California is a Mediterranean climate, uh, really wet winters, uh, really, really dry summers. Um, so that tends to lead to that type of, of vegetation growing. Um, there's very little undisturbed Mediterranean shrubland that still exists, really heavily used for ag, uh, especially with the advent of irrigation. Um, and then there are just a lot of cities that are, that are located in, in the Mediterranean areas around the world. Um, again, here you have a typical curve, uh, so low summer precipitation, higher winter, and then you have, again, low temperatures, higher summer, summer temperatures. Um, this is what a typical chaparral ecosystem looks like. Um, some species you would find are like quail, a lot of hares, uh, rabbits, um, you get like burrowing owls, uh, grasslands and like your ver vernal pool ecosystems that can exist in, in Mediterranean uh, ecosystems. And so really unique biodiversity that, that exists in these places. <clears throat> okay, so next is a tropical dry forest. Um, this also has seasonal rainfall, pretty similar to, um, to Mediterranean climates, but they get a lot of precipitation, um, much more than, than Mediterranean ecosystems uh, in terms of the maximum amount of precipitation they can get. And what's interesting is they get these monsoon seasons where they have a lot of seasonal rainfall. Uh, but then they can go, you know, seasons with droughts in between those monsoons. And so you have species that become adapted to survive those drought-like conditions. Um, a lot of these forests are in areas of, of uh, urban development and high human population, and they tend to be harvested for uh, fuel and building materials because of the large populations that are, are nearby. And a lot of the forests have been converted uh, for farming and grazing. Uh, people need their crops, people need their animals, their livestock. So pretty much every biome is gonna have those type of impacts um, associated with them. The tropical rainforest uh, has the most amount of rainfall, over 200 centimeters. Some places you're getting you know, up to 500 centimeters of rainfall. Because of all of this rain, the nutrients are really low in the soils. And most of the nutrients are in the plants and the biomass that are growing. And the water tends to leach all of the nutrients in the soil profile. So the nutrients will dissolve in the water and then infiltrate down into the lower soil layers. So those upper soil layers will, will be really devoid of, of nutrients or really nutrient poor. Um, tropical rainforests have multi-layered canopies. So they're really tall, um, dense canopy structures, and they also have epiphytic plants, uh, which are plants like we mentioned uh, in the last couple chapter. I can't remember which one, but basically plants that live on other plants. Um, and, and so you get these real dense multi-layered canopies, um, and they have a really high diversity of, of species. Some of the largest um, species diversity uh, around the globe are in tropical rainforests. Um, tropical rainforests get a lot of impacts from logging and agriculture. A lot of the populations there are kind of doing slash and burn, converting into ag, converting into livestock areas. And um, a lot of the, the developed countries where tropical rainforests exist, not developed, but a lot of the countries 
where tropical rainforests exist tend to be underdeveloped or poorer countries. And so they have to exploit the resources from the, the tropical rainforest in order to make ends meet and to provide for their family. Um, and so this kind of goes back to our sustainability discussion where, you know, when you're in that situation, you're going to do whatever you can to really provide for your family. And that's what these populations are doing. Um, and so they're really impacting the tropical rainforest for, for those reasons. And so forestry can be sustainable, but uh, a lot of the times the practices aren't and uh, people just don't do it in a sustainable way. And it could be due to a lot of factors um, that leads to those non-sustainable practices. So continuing forward, uh, temperate deciduous forests. Uh, these forests are typically in uh, the eastern half of the United States. Uh, Canada, uh, Southern Africa, and then all over kind of Europe and Asia. These are uh, kind of like your deciduous forests, like you, you would think about uh, if you were ever seeing pictures of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, like the trees changing color, that's kind of what these forests uh, resemble. And uh, they get about 75 to 100 centimeters of rain. Uh, and this is pretty much evenly throughout the year. We don't really have a season where we get most of our rain. It's not like, um, you know, California where all the rains in the winter, no rain in the summer. Uh, they, they get winter rains, they get summer thunderstorms. Um, and, and so the, the vegetation can grow, um, have a, long, a much longer growing season. Although during the winter, they typically lose their leaves um, because the temperatures get colder um, and uh, they basically replace them and grow more biomass as it warms up in the spring and the summer. Um, so again, long growing season, fairly mild winters, depending on the latitude, it can get somewhat colder and they can experience uh, snow, uh, lower temperatures. Uh, and if you compare these to tropical rainforests where the trees are, are scattered kind of throughout the forest, the deciduous forests have much fewer species. Um, so where a tropical rainforest has like, you know, hundreds of species of trees in like a acre of, of land, in a deciduous forest, you would have like two or three dominant species in an acre of land, um, like your oaks and, you know, like maples or, or whatever, depending on your location. Um, and so it's just, you know, really different in terms of biodiversity with, with deciduous forests compared to like tropical forests. Um, a lot of them have been uh, affected by human activity, especially uh, in the more developed areas cleared for farming. Like I said, this is probably going to be a human impact on every biome. Um, and, and logging is a big uh, factor too because hardwoods are really good for building, um, really good source of, of, of wood. Um, and a lot of the population centers are in, say, Eastern North America and Europe. And so they're using those resources right, to live and sustain themselves. And so uh, even precipitation throughout the year and any typical like warm summers, cooler, cooler winters. And so next is the temperate rainforest. So this is different from the tropical rainforest in that the temperature is cooler. Um, and you get still get a lot of rain. So you think of areas like Washington, Oregon, Northern California, uh, where you get moist air, a lot of rain um, in these areas. Uh, but there's a cooler climate uh, in these biomes. Um, and so cooler climate slows evaporation, typically damp, uh, pretty fertile soils, uh, milder temperatures. So they're not as warm as the tropics, but, but still fairly mild. Um, and they have a lot of conifer trees, so things like species like Sitka spruce, Douglas fir, hemlock, uh, and you can get what's called old growth forests, which have trees that are really old, really young, and in between. Um, secondary growth forests are forests that have been logged, and all of the trees are pretty much the same age because they all started growing at the same time. So your old growth forests are kind of your climax communities, kind of really old, uh, diverse um, forest ecosystems. And there's not a lot of old growth forests left because again, humans are gonna, are gonna harvest those. Um, you can also have some deciduous trees, so like cottonwood, maple, uh, if there's enough uh, sunlight available. 
And then the trees typically are covered with mosses and ferns because of the, the availability of water and the dampness in these areas. Um, and what's also cool is the dead trees will fall to the ground and then they'll provide sites for new growth. And so they're referred to as nurse trees because they're basically nursing other, other species of trees to grow in these areas. Um, get a lot of insects, uh, a lot of cool bird species, uh, lots of slugs. So if you've ever been up to like Humboldt in the Redwoods, you've probably seen the banana slugs, which are pretty cool. Uh, lots of big mammal species, so like elk, deer, beavers, uh, bears, and then uh, you typically get a lot of uh, raptors and owl species because uh, there are usually a lot of um, food sources like uh, rodents and that sort of thing. Uh, lots of salmon in those streams and areas that are located uh, in your temperate rainforests, so like your northern streams in, in, in California. Um, but again, like every other forest, humans have, have, have logged them. Um, and, and so, you know, it's leading to a lot of fragmentation and, um, you know, leading to us having to protect these fragments in order to make sure these, these temperate rainforests are, are still around in the future. Uh, so, so here's some kind of climate curves for temperate rainforests. So lots of rain, like we see with the precipitation curve here. And then, you know, your typical cooler in the winter, warmer in the summer. Uh, owl species, northern spotted owl. Um, this is what a typical uh, temperate rainforest looks like. It always reminds me of like a dinosaur world, like you would think in a you would see in a dinosaur movie, lots of ferns, mosses, etc., cetera, uh, growing in these biomes. Next is the Taiega, uh, northern conifer forest, or what's also known as the boreal forest. Um, this receives uh, a little less rain, um, so about 25 to 100 centimeters of precipitation, and it has short cool summers and long winters with uh, most of the precipitation coming as snowfall. Um, and the climate's really humid because of the spring snow melt. Um, and then you have low temperatures reducing evaporation. And so you have much more water moisture in the air. Um, and the trees tend to be adapted to these winter-like conditions. And so because of the snow is pretty prevalent, the trees will have uh, pretty flexible branches so they can support the weight. They'll be shaped as like a spire, so real pointy on the top, needle-shaped leaves so that they can prevent that water loss. And just like with every forest, um, being impacted by humans, but less severe, um, because the population density is a lot lower in, in the uh, boreal forest because it does have somewhat more uh, harsh conditions than, than what you have in the other biomes that we've talked about. Logging is pretty common um, and, and also herding, especially in uh, species like reindeer um, and other boreal species like you would see kind of in Russia. Um, here's average curves, so temperature, uh, warmer in the summer, fairly cold in the winter, uh, lower precipitation, a lot of that coming as snow. Uh, so you get lots of snow, um, you know, pointy trees, spire-like trees to help shed that snow off, flexible branches to kind of help deal with that weight. All right, so one of the last biomes, tundra. Uh, this is, you know, north of the, of the uh, boreal forest in terms of latitude really, really cold, uh, has permafrost, which is that permanently frozen soil layer, um, and it is pretty dry. So even though it has snow and it's cold, it's actually dry. It's just that the snow doesn't melt, uh, really, and it accumulates because of that permanently fro frozen uh, permafrost. Um, has really short, wet summers. The soils are waterlogged. Um, and plants usually don't grow too tall because of the extreme conditions. And um, the communities in the tundra are known as alpine ecosystems, alpine tundra ecosystems. And like I mentioned, you can find these on mountaintops in the Sierras. So you go up to like nine, 10,000 feet in elevation in the Sierras and you'll find alpine ecosystems, uh, which is pretty cool uh, that we don't have to go, you know, 80 degrees latitude uh, to see 
these tundra ecosystems. Um, human impacts a little less because people really don't live in these regions. Very few uh, populations, or if there is a population, it's relatively small. Um, the, the people that do live there are usually like indigenous natives, uh, kind of substance um, populations where they live off the land. Um, they take advantage of kind of everything that they have in terms of available resources. Um, and but what's really important for these resources is that because the um, conditions are so extreme and the growing seasons are so short, that if you damage these ecosystems, it takes a long time to regenerate and heal. Um, and so you know, we have to kind of be uh, knowledgeable of that whenever we uh, impact these types of ecosystems. And so really cold during the winter, it does get warm during the summer. It's very short. Uh, very low precipitation. Um, so again, it's pretty dry, even though you do see kind of snow on the landscape. Uh, typical species you find, you know, muskox, uh, snowy owls. Uh, this is tundra landscape during, during the summertime. Uh, really interesting ecosystems. All right, so now that we've looked at the major terrestrial ecosystems, we're now going to just kind of go through the aquatic ecosystems. Um, just like the terrestrial ecosystems, there are environmental factors that are kind of shaping um, the, the, the different areas that you see in the aquatic environments. Um, the key factors that kind of tend to determine the communities that are in the aquatic ecosystem are things like uh, how far down does light go into the water? So the ability of the sun's rays to make it into the water column. How deep is the water column? Uh, what is the substrate that's on the bottom? Uh, is it rock? Is it sand, um, et cetera? What's the temperature of the water? What types of uh, substances are dissolved in the water? Is there you know, a lot of dissolved salts? Is there enough oxygen, et cetera? Um, and so aquatic ecosystems that don't have a lot of dissolved salts, fairly obvious, it's freshwater ecosystems. If they have a high salt content, we refer to them as marine ecosystems. And so looking at marine ecosystems first, the marine ecosystem can be divided into a couple of different zones. Um, one of the first zones we're going to mention is the pelagic region, which is basically the open sea. Um, so if you're off the continental shelf, you're kind of out in the ocean, uh, that's known as the pelagic region. Then you have a uh, vertical zone. So this is more of a horizontal zone. So like this way, right? So if you have like the coast, right? And then you have like the deep ocean, right? Your pelagic would be like out here, right? So it's more of a horizontal zonation. The euphotic zone is more of like a vertical zonation. So the euphotic zone is the upper layer of the ocean where the sun's rays make it through. So once you get so deep, right, um, in the water column, the sun doesn't make it down anymore. And so that's not part of the euphotic zone. So the euphotic zone is where you find things like your phytoplankton. So these are microscopic plants that are floating in the ocean and they actually perform photosynthesis and they serve as like the basis of the food web for these oceanic uh, ecosystems. And so you have these zooplankton that will feed on the phytoplankton and then you'll have fishes and other organisms that will feed on both the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. And then they kind of support the upper consumers uh, like your carnivores and, and those sorts of organisms. And so the aquatic ecosystems, if they're productive, they'll have a lot of essential nutrients and then they'll have a lot of oxygen uh, within the water column. And so here we kind of see this horizontal, horizontal and vertical kind of uh, zonations. So here you have like your intertidal areas and then out here is your pelagic. So this area here would be like your photic zone, usually about 200 meters and up is where sunlight's penetrating. This downward is not your euphotic zone. There's some other terms that this is kind of separated into, but we're really not gonna go into it. Uh, one of the main ones is just like the um, 
abyssal ecosystem, which is kind of the benthic ecosystem at the really deep parts of the ocean, no sunlight down there. Um, and then the types of organisms you get will vary along these depths and then by the amount of uh, sunlight that's available in these, in these different zones. Um, for marine ecosystems, you also can get benthic organisms. And so we already talked about this a little bit and that the abyssal ecosystem is, are those deep uh, benthic organisms. So the benthic organisms are organisms that are living on the ocean bottom. They're either attached or not attached. They're usually like on the surface of the, the, the substrates or they're burrowing down into the substrates. Um, and animals usually are like scavengers in the abyssal ecosystems. Uh, many of them, I don't know why this text is like this, but many of them are typically small. They'll generate light for themselves so that they can find food or attract food. So one of the more famous examples is the angler fish and how it has a little light that it kind of dangles to attract uh, little fish to it and they will eat them. And so you have like these really neat um, evolutionary adaptations kind of in these deeper environments that we don't really see in the upper levels of, of the marine ecosystems. Um, and like we mentioned, substrate's really important for the kind of benthic communities that you'll have. Um, if it's like a shifting sandy substrate, you can't really get large plants and algae because they can't, they don't really have anything to hold on to. So they're usually found in like your rocky um, substrates. And um, so for example, the coast of California is really rocky. So you get like a lot of algae, a lot of kelp forests that exist uh, along the, the coastlines. Whereas the East Coast, uh, so for example, like the coast of North Carolina, is a really sandy substrate. And so you get very different organisms there. Um, and we'll show kind of an image of that here in a second. Mud substrate has very little oxygen, but it's good for rooted plants. Um, and so again, depending on the kind of straight <clears throat> substrate can really determine what kind of organisms that, that you see. So for example, if you're a rocky substrate, you have like all of these attachment points for different types of kelp and, and aquatic plants and other organisms like sea stars and barnacles and uh, different types of crabs and uh, whelks and you know sea snails, etc. But whenever you have these sandy environments, you have like your dunes and your uh, sea or uh, uh, dune grass you have a lot of burrowing animals, um, like your limpets and your ghost crabs, and you have like flounders, your flatfishes, and uh, sand dollars, and um, blue crabs, which are really famous off the coast of North Carolina. And, um, you know, just very, very different uh, species composition compared to what you would see in it's like your rocky intertidal areas. Now, another type of ecosystem that, that you can find in the marine environment are coral reef ecosystems. These are <clears throat> ecosystems that are primarily made up of coral animals, and they build their exoskeletons out of uh, calcium. And the corals contain this algae symbiont. It's a single-celled algae uh, symbionts. They live within the site inside the corals. They're called uh, zooandelli. Uh, and, and that algae produces or, or does the process of photosynthesis. And, and so they provide carbohydrates and sugars for the coral, and the coral provides a home for the algae. And because the coral need the algae to help with the food, they have to be found in warm water that is clear and has a lot of sunlight. Um, and so if this water deviates from these ideal conditions, the algae will die and leave the corals, and then the corals will die. And that's actually what coral bleaching is. It's when the corals die because the algae has been expelled from the coral or has died because of uh, unfavorable conditions. And so here's some pictures of a coral reef. Um, the Great Barrier Reef on the lower right. And then there are uh, areas that are kind of showing where you find reefs. So there, um, 
you know, you got some of it here in the Caribbean. Um, and so again, near the equator, those warmer waters uh, where that are usually shallower, where you can get a lot of sunlight, uh, good environment for, for that algae. Uh, another marine ecosystem are mangrove swamps. These are pretty similar to tropical forest ecosystems, but are in the shallow water of the coastlines. And the trees are really good at tolerating high salt content. And so they actually can take up the salt and then excrete it from their leaves. And they have these really cool root systems um, that can go above the water. And they also can trap sediment, um, which will help kind of develop terrestrial ecosystems. And, and, and mangrove swamps are also really important habitats for juvenile uh, life stages of, of many different fish species and aquatic organisms that live in the ocean. And so the, the juvenile uh, individuals will kind of grow in the protection of the roots in the mangrove swamp. And then as they get older, they'll then venture out and say the open ocean or the shallower reef areas um, that are adjacent to the mangrove swamp ecosystems. Now, a final ecosystem we're gonna mention with the marine ecosystems are estuaries. So these are uh, areas where freshwater sources, so let's say like a river, will enter the ocean. And you basically get this kind of gradient from freshwater to brackish water to um, your high salinity ocean water. And so the organisms that live there are really adapted to this varying levels of salinity um, that happens as you get high tide, low tide, and then, you know, more river flow or more river discharge when it rains or less river discharge when it becomes dry. Mm -hmm. And estuaries are super productive ecosystems. Uh, they're shallow, nutrient rich, really good nursery sites for fishes. Again, the fish can kind of go up in the estuarine grasses and, and, um, kind of leave the, the area where, say, those ocean predators would, would hunt for them. Um, and you find a lot of crustaceans, a lot of crabs, a lot of shrimp in estuaries. So it's a really, really good productive ecosystems. Um, oceans, a large portion of the Earth's surface over, uh, you know, almost three quarters of the Earth's surface, 70% is covered. But a lot of overfishing in the oceans have, you know, really harmed those environments. Um, fish farming has affected uh, kind of nutrient levels and allowed diseases to spread from those aquaculture farms into wild populations. Estuaries have, uh, you know, the rivers run into the estuaries. And so what you get is runoff from farms going into rivers and those rivers carrying that runoff into estuaries. So like fertilizer, animal waste, pesticides that come off of farmlands will, will damage those estuarine environments. And then just using ocean as transportation and oil drilling and all of that stuff has, has led to the pollution of the ocean. And then us just kind of throwing trash away and, and not you know, getting rid of it like we should has led to quite a bit of pollution in, in those ocean environments. So here's just a picture of a mangrove swamp. Not really a good picture, but you can kind of see the trees. And then these are the little roots here down in this area. And they actually go into the bottom. Uh, and the roots are kind of like, I'm not even going to try to draw it. It's going to be terrible. Um, kind of arched and, and like have open areas in between and that sort of thing. Google mangrove swamps and, and you'll see some really good pictures probably. Uh, but they're really interesting habitats. And so the last type of biomes we're going to mention are uh, freshwater ecosystems. So freshwater ecosystems can, can be separated into two different categories. You can have stationary and running. Uh, so you have your lakes, ponds, and you have your streams and your rivers. And so the lakes and ponds can basically be divided into zones just like your uh, oceanic marine ecosystems can. So the littoral zone is the area of a lake where it has rooted vegetation. And so you can have emergent plants that will have vegetation that is above the water surface or on the water surface. So think of like a lily pad where it's floating on the water surface. 
They also can have submerged plants, which is just vegetation that stays below the water surface. It never kind of breaks that surface le level. Then you can have a, lim a limnic zone, uh, which is where there's no rooted vegetation. So basically no, um, yeah, no rooted vegetation in that area. Now, just like with the ocean, productivity is affected by a lot of different environmental factors. So again, the communities you get in a specific lake or zone in a lake or a pond is going to be determined by abiotic factors. Um, so the temperature is going to determine, you know, rate of photosynthesis and, and what kind of uh, producers can live in that uh, ecosystem. Shallow water means that the water column has access to more light, uh, so more photosynthesis. Erosion will bring in nutrients, uh, but it can also make the, the areas shallower. And then dissolved oxygen, oxygen, so how much oxygen is in the water determines how well, you know, how many species it can support, and not only species, but also the abundance. If there's a lot of oxygen, it can hold more individuals, et cetera. And mixing is very important because it allows oxygen to kind of get throughout the entire water column. Um, if there's not a lot of mixing, you actually can get a separation where you can have a layer kind of at the lower portion of the sediment where oxygen is not present and, and it's called basically like a dead zone um, where organisms can't really survive in that lower area. So mixing is very important for dissolved oxygen concentration. Now with lakes and ponds, there are kind of two different types. There's oli um, ol oligotrophic lakes. So these are deep lakes, nutrient poor, and then eutrophic lakes, which are typically shallow and nutrient rich. Uh, the deeper ones are typically colder, shallow ones are warmer, mainly because it's, you know, it's easier to warm shallower water with the amount of solar radiation than it is colder water, just not enough heat energy to warm that deep, uh, that deep water, uh, large volume of water. And then like we mentioned, oxygen is very important. So you need that mixing and the amount of oxygen that is used by bacteria and fungi and other decomposers to break down organic matter that falls to the bottom of the ocean is called BOD. So biochemical oxygen demand. And so basically you can measure that based off of how, how much organic matter is, is in that freshwater ecosystem. Now for the running freshwater ecosystems, your streams and rivers, uh, most of them are shallow. Uh, some of them can be deep, some of them can be very large, uh, but most of them are, are relatively, you know, smaller bodies of water, shallower bodies of water. Um, and for photosynthetic organisms, it's really hard for them to accumulate nutrients necessary for growth because um, the flow of the streams. And so a lot of times clear streams just aren't productive. And then the debris that's into the streams basically comes from terrestrial, uh, terrestrial sources. So like leaves and branches falling from trees into the, the aquatic environment, et cetera. Now the animals, the algae and the fungi that are um, in the river is um, known as the periphyton. So if they're attached to the rocks or other objects on the bottom, they're known as, as periphyton, okay? Um, there are also swamps and marshes. So swamps are basically wetland environments that have trees kind of living in that, uh, flooded ecosystem and swamps can be permanently flooded or seasonally flooded but typically flooded for, for a majority of the year. Marshes are wetlands that are dominated by grasses and reeds so swamps have those trees whereas marshes typically grasses and um, reed bulrush type vegetation um, and Typically, these swamps and marshes are successional states that will eventually, you know, become those terrestrial communities as they kind of fill in over the next hundred or thousand of years with sediment, uh, like we were looking at in that aquatic succession example. 
Uh, human impact every freshwater ecosystem has pretty much been affected by humans. Um, you know, we take fresh water from those ecosystems and use them to drink or cook or whatever. Um, we have agricultural runoff, we have pollution that settles in it, we have sedimentation that flows from our building and construction sites into those areas and trash that can somehow find their way in the river. And so, you know, pretty much every eco, every freshwater ecosystem has, has been impacted either directly or indirectly by, by humans. Uh, so here's an example of, you know, kind of a lake ecosystem. Just, just different species you can find and different zonations. And we didn't really talk about a lot of these zonations. Uh, it was really similar to the ocean where you have like your benthic zone where you have your um, species that are living on the floor of the substrate. You have your euphotic zone, right, where all that light comes in and photosynthesis happens. Um, and so it's pretty similar to to the ocean, but but a little different as well. Okay. And so that's it for chapter six. Uh, a lot of information in there. I know I went over it kind of quickly, but it's really not too complicated. It's just a lot of memorization for this one. Um, and so just kind of go over the summary, like always, see where the big points are. Um, and as always, let me know if you have any questions, if you have any concerns. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you in the next chapter.